Hi, I'm Jenna, and this is your News in 60. Join us for all of our Easter celebrations at Broad Street. Wednesday, March 27th, we are going to have a matzo ball soup for dinner. And then join us for, we're going to hear about the Jewish tradition of the Passover Seder. And on Thursday, March 28th, join us for Maundy Thursday service. We'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper in the sanctuary at 6.30 p.m. And then Friday, we have our Good Friday Tenebrae service on March 29th at 6.30. Join us in the sanctuary. There will be a narrative of the Passion of Christ, and we read from Scripture. We'll have candles that will be extinguished, and the sanctuary will be progressively darkened, leading to Christ's death on the cross. It will be an incredible time of worship and thought. On Easter Sunday, we're going to have our sunrise service at Johnson Woods at 7 a.m. Join us for an incredible service as we watch the sunrise and bring something for breakfast, and we'll eat something afterward. And at the church, we will have an 8.30 Easter service at Triplet Hall for Living Water, Living Spirit. 9.30, we'll have Sunday school hour as usual. And at 10.45, we'll have the contemporary and the traditional service to celebrate the risen Lord and Savior. This is a great time to invite people to our church. Easter is so incredible here at Broad Street. So invite a friend, invite a neighbor, put it on Facebook. We would love to have people come and celebrate Easter with us. And then last, ladies, we are going to have a mini women's retreat on April 7th at Johnston Woods. Be sure to invite everyone. It's going to be a great day of eating, fellowship, reflection. We're going to have some Christian yoga, some crafts, hiking. It's going to be a sweet time. Register on Broad Street's website at bsumc.org. It's only $40. So be sure to tell a friend and come join us. That's your news in 60.
Good morning. Good morning. It is a happy Palm Sunday, and it actually sounded like a parade today as we gathered, and I was listening to you. It sounded happy and joyful, like it, will, it was on that Palm Sunday long ago, when people waved their palm branches and put their coats in the road and welcomed the king and said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. My name is Mary Ketcherson, and I'm one of the directors at Unity Center, which is our outreach ministry in East Cleveland. And I do welcome each of you on this Palm Sunday and those that will be worshiping or are worshiping with us online as well. Here in the sanctuary, there is a red attendance pad at the end of your pew. Please take that and take time to register your attendance. Uh, even if you've been, been, been a member here for a long time or if you're a visitor, and if you're a visitor, please put that extra information on there so that we can contact you this week. Um, this week is Holy Week. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, and there are special services that are be conducted throughout the week. Please take a minute to look at the back of your bulletin, and those are listed there and the times that they will be held and where they will be. And now, I invite any children that are in the sanctuary to go to the narthex right now with your palm branch and be part of the palm processional that's going to be taking place in just a minute. And if you are older than five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten and want to be part of that processional, you are welcome too because we are all children of God. Now, I want to invite you all to stand together as we read our call to worship responsively. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you. The Lord is God, who has given us light. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Thanks to the Lord, who is good. For God's love forever. Let us join together in our opening hymn, All Glory, Lord, and Honor, and be sure to wave your palm branches high.
unite our voices in the opening prayer. Almighty God, on this day, your son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along the way. Let those branches be for us the signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. That is so beautiful, isn't it? One of the great gifts we have in this relationship that we have with our Lord and our God is that we get to share. He invites us into this conversation. He invites us to pray, and that's what prayer is, isn't it? an opportunity not only to speak our heart to God, but for us to quieten our soul, our minds, and the busyness of ourselves, and listen, and hear the word of our holy Lord, our God, our Redeemer. So let's go to God in prayer at this time. Oh Lord, you've called us out. 
You've called us to step into this special relationship with you to, to open ourselves up to you, to not just pour out what is going on in us and about us and around us, but that we might hear not only who you are and who you call us to be and to become. Lord, we learn by not only talking, but by listening. And so in this time, we want to hear you. We want to open ourselves up to that message of grace, that message of life, that we might know you both as Redeemer and King. We might know you as the one who leads the procession and the one who guides the individual. The one who gives us a glimpse of glory and know you as the one who speaks to us that still small voice that sustains us when we hit rock bottom. Thank you, Lord, for being our God of all of life, not just the glorious times, but all times. Thank you, Lord, for not just carrying your name, but being someone who has the opportunity to follow you and to walk where you have walked and to take the words of life and be a, not just a guardian, but one who transfers and passes them on to others. Allow us to take that holy appointment and allow us to use it well as we share good news, as we share hope, as we share a message. Hear our prayers as we intercede for a world that needs a true king, a true leader, one who has solutions rather than simply creating more problems. For one who speaks peace, but speaks a direction to go and with purpose. Bring us together, Lord. Show us your way that we may lay aside our own selfish ambition and to take up that cross that you freely share. Take this service, Lord, and accomplish what you wish. And may we freely accept what you call us to be about and move in that way that leads to life eternal. All this, Lord, we seek, you the King of Kings. And we pray in the manner in which you continually teach us in saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is a wonderful thing for us to share how God is moving and working in our midst, the ways in which God uses us to make a difference in the lives of other people, both with our faithfulness, with our giving, but also our faithfulness in giving of our abilities and talents. Barbara has a wonderful testimony to share with us, and I invite her to come and talk about one of those powerful ministries 
that you'll have an opportunity to be a part of. Good morning. My name is Barbara Whitney, and I've come in front of you today to talk about a new class that is starting at Broad Street Methodist called Journey Through Grief. Um, this is a national program that some of you may have heard of called Grief Share, and it's Grief Share is sponsoring our program here at our church. Um, unfortunately, grief comes in many forms for all of us. It could be a child, our parents, our grandparents, um, loved family members, maybe even a dear friend. And I think I would ask you if you've experienced grief in your lifetime to just raise your hand because it is kind of a universal thing that we all deal with. For me, it was my spouse. I lost a wonderful man of 35 years, two years ago to cancer. And at that time when it happens, your head and your eyes are seeing what's happened and you understand it, but your heart never does. And I, I wrote a speech for you, but you know, when your heart's pounding and your stomach's twirling and you're nervous and you know you're supposed to say something, so here goes. Um, I became a hermit in my house and I wouldn't answer the phone. I didn't want to go anywhere. Um, I know my family was worried about me, but I just couldn't deal with it. And a dear friend in the community talked to me several times about a grief share program that was being offered, and I agreed to grow. I agreed to go. Um, she took it a step further, and she had another friend who had lost their son, and she was going to the class and she asked her to meet me outside and even sent her a picture of what I looked like because she knew that I would probably back out, and she was right. Um, but I will tell you, honestly, Grief Share saved my life. It's a 12-week class. You meet once a week. Um, it, I went to the first 12 weeks, and then when the fall class started, I went back, and I did it again. And I will tell you that there is recovery from your loss, but for me, it reaffirmed that even though I felt alone, I was never alone because Christ walked with me that whole way. And I honestly believe that friend and that woman and that class, I was meant to be in because Christ was trying to lead me to the direction to come out more positive. So, our class is starting on Monday, April 1st. It will be from 6 to 8. I know in this day and age, you probably think, oh, I can't commit to 12 weeks. This is an open class. You can come in and go when you can, and you have a workbook. The cost of the workbook is $20. Um, I would ask that if you know someone in our community or you know someone in our church that possibly could benefit from this class, please extend an invitation to them. Um, I'll be out in the commons area. We have some little flyers that you can pick up from me if you would like, um, and it is in the book. You can register for it either by calling the office or online, and I just thank you for listening to this, and this class means a lot to my heart, so thank you. Thank you for sharing, Barbara. I think we can benefit from that, that work. Now, my friends, with support and a faithfulness to God, let us give to the Lord our tithes and his offerings.
Almighty and everlasting God, as we bring our gifts and lay them at your altar, we remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their coats on the road, shouting Hosanna as Jesus passed. We know Jesus the Messiah came in compassion and mercy to heal and love and save. May these gifts, and yes, our very lives, be used by you to heal and love in a broken world. In the name of your anointed one, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you will remain standing, please, as we hear God's word for us found in Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside the street, tied to it at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! 
Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for all God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I have that effect upon people. <laughs> I remember going on a few journeys with my parents. They didn't happen often when we were children. But those journeys were always, uh, let's say, interesting. We had a, at that time, we had a 1959 Dodge station wagon. I wish I had it now. That was a car. If you leaned up against it, it did not give way. Let's put it this way. It had substance to it. Those fenders did not bend easily. It was a, a long vehicle, and as I remember, it was somewhat underpowered. It had a, it had a straight inline six-cylinder engine and three on the tree, okay? But it was ours. And uh, it was interesting to go on that trip with my parents. The coolest thing about this station wagon was the rear window. You know, we talk about tailgates. We don't know anything about that, right? This rear window on this Dodge station wagon had a crank on it. And you could crank that thing down, and that window would come down. Now, the interesting thing about this particular thing, we lived on a dirt road. How many of you ever lived on a dirt road, yeah? Interesting thing about a dirt road, even when it rains, it's still dirt, right? It becomes a liquefied form of it. But it was cool anyway. No matter what, it was before the age of car seats. Imagine that, how we even survived. The coolest thing about it was four of us kids in that back seat, and sometimes dad would even fold down the back seat. And you had this large platform back there. And the best part of it all was that when you go around a curve, because you know what you would do? You would not remain stationary. Gravity was a cool thing. It would, you would slide. And don't be the smallest one caught on the end. That's all I'll say. You become smaller. But it was great. We'd start out on the trip, and it was everything was great for the first few miles. And after a while, you'd get hot, and your brother would be in your way. That's all I'll say about it. <laughs> Somebody's experienced that before. <laughs> and after a while, you know, on these curvy mountain roads, after a while, eventually there would be a voice that would venture to say, you all know what the voice said, don't you? You got it? Are we? Okay. You know, and... That was a, to us, it was a reasonable question. For some reason, to my dad, it really did not resonate with him. There was always an answer, and it would, the answer would get louder as you would go along, and the numbers of times the question was asked, 
the response would escalate as well. No, we're not there yet. You know, not there yet. In the Gospel of Mark, with the very beginning of the Gospel, with Jesus' baptism and John the Baptist out in the wilderness, they start on a journey together, right? And he calls the disciples and they follow and they listen and people are beginning to see that Jesus was more than just a popular rabbi. And they were asking questions. It became apparent in the Gospel of Mark that the evil spirits and all the other folks very well knew who Jesus was. And when they encountered or ventured to say anything about it, at the first, what would he say? Shh, not yet. Shh, not yet. As that journey continues and it picks up some speed and it escalates and things are happening and they, they come to a particular pivotal point. Jesus then sets his face toward Jerusalem. And they go to Jerusalem for the purpose that is not something that you would look forward to. And he says, for I'm going there to die. The disciples didn't want to hear that. The wonderful thing about this event, this traveling with Jesus, is that every place they go, they encounter all kinds of different people. (laughs) They encounter all kinds of different folks. A lot of these folks didn't fit in with anything else, but yet as they encountered Jesus, Jesus didn't ignore them. What did he do? He reached out, he touched them. Many were healed. Many became much more than what they were before. And what does Jesus invite them to do? Come and follow him, right? He always has room for one more. He always has a place for somebody else to come in and join I like that image, don't you? The parade didn't begin on Palm Sunday, my friends. It started at the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. But I would venture to go all the way back even further than then. Maybe even to the Garden of Eden. Especially as they are exiting from it, right? Because everybody got sideways with where God would call them to be. That parade began a long time ago. With the very image of God of saying, my people are important. I'll provide a way for redemption. I'll provide a way for grace and forgiveness. I'll provide a way for them to have hope. And a step and follow. I like the images of those people who have picked up. Jesus picked up, right? <laughs> I like that image, don't you? Jesus who picks up people, you know, on this journey. See, the parade grows the further he travels. He picked up, of course, Peter, James, and John, right? Those folks fishermen on dry land. And then he picks up a host of others, Nathaniel and and others, and they find a place. Picks up the two Marys. Like that, don't you? Martha as well, practical Martha. She becomes a part of that traveling group. Even Peter's mother. I like that image, don't you? A woman at a well. 
a woman who dared above all things to reach out and to touch Jesus's garment with intention to be made whole. And just before this, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is traveling from Jericho down to Jerusalem. And he encounters a blind man called Bartimaeus, who hears that Jesus is coming and cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And in spite of everybody telling him to shut up and be quiet and stop making a scene, he cries out all the more, and Jesus says, Come. <laughs> Have him come to me. And he tosses off his mantle, his garment, his protection from all the world just to follow Jesus. You ever thought about that? I know a member of my choir has. <laughs> and he follows and he joins that parade. That prayed. See, it didn't start on the outer walls of Jerusalem on what we now call Palm Sunday. It started a long time before. It started when God said, we have to make a way for people to know me. To not just know me, but to follow me to live with me and for me, to be a light in a world of darkness. See, they follow Jesus. And on that day, the folks are thinking, this is going to be it. And they got their palm branches. I should have brought mine up here. Somebody hold up a palm branch for me. Thank you. Yes. You see that palm branch? That wasn't just the clippings from spring pruning. It was a symbol of the people of Israel. The money that is used within the temple courts to purchase the sacrifices, do you know what is on the back of that coin? It's an imprint of a palm branch. You got it? Do you understand what that means? It's a part of their identity. It's who they are. It'd be like you waving the red, white, and blue. Okay? It's exactly what was going on on that day. And one of the other gospel writers, some of the, the Pharisees are telling the disciples and the other followers of Jesus and even the children to be quiet. Hush. Shh. You know, and Jesus says, nah, it's gone too far now. <laughs> we're, we're past the time of hushing and being quiet about it. It's time to say something. It's time to do, to be, to proclaim. He says, if they were quiet, guess what? The rocks would find a voice. And they would start crying out. That'd be something, wouldn't it? That'd be quite a noise. So here they are. They're traveling together, and Jesus is on this young colt of a donkey. I always wondered whether Jesus' feet drug the ground or not. I don't know. I'm a little crazy on that. I wonder if that colt, who'd never been ridden before, bucked a little bit. So that meant that Jesus was pretty good in riding, wouldn't you think? And there in that image given by the Old Testament prophets of the King of Kings, the God of glory, King David's throne to be brought up 
and claimed again. And all those Romans would be tossed out on their heads. <laughs> and life's going to be better. And they make their travel toward the temple. Toward the temple. And everybody's saying, Hosanna. Yeah, we knew he was that one. We knew he was the one. It's going to be good. It's going to be great. Growing up where I did, the coal fields and with one of the things other than coal mining, the way in which folks made a good living was by working for the railroad. And some of y'all have some connections with that, with the railroad. Always fascinated by those. I didn't grow up in the, the age of the steam engines, but once a year we would have a steam engine, and it was around Christmas. And I won't, that's another story for another time. But I grew up with the diesel locomotives. You know what those are like. They still use them today. Every once in a while around Cleveland, if you're quiet enough and the sirens quieten down a little bit, you can hear those rumble of those locomotives, of those engines. The cool thing about trains is this, that the carriages, the passenger carriages and the, the freight cars and the coal cars, all of them are made to where they can go either way. Did you know that? They have those wonderful couplings that go like that, and they're on each end. And no matter which way the train is made up, you're never in the wrong direction. <laughs> go figure. But that was not the case with the locomotives, was it? Now, the truth is, a locomotive, the diesel-powered locomotives particularly, can go as fast in reverse as they can going forward. Did you know that? But I sure wouldn't want to be the engineer going backward, would you? Not really knowing what was behind you. Because if you're going forward, you got those windows. They're not great big, but you can still see where you're going. See, for the rest of the train, it didn't matter, right? It just depends upon where the power was, where the engine was, that they would travel in that direction. Over across the ridge from where I grew up in Honey Branch, there was a place that was called Hospital Holler. Guess what? The reason why it was called Hospital Hall. Anybody want to venture a guess, Doc? That's where the hospital was for what it was worth. But just down from that was Clinchfield Coal Company's rail yard and the railroad. They had a huge building there where you could take a locomotive into it and they could completely dismantle it and put it back together without even moving it. And there in the center of that, looking like a huge spoke of a wagon wheel, was something that was called a turntable. Now, I'm not talking about something that records go on. And you would play music on this turntable was large enough to where a locomotive could pull onto it and it would move. And radiating from that turntable, there were an infinite number of junctures with other trail or rail lines where they could travel on the tracks.
as Jesus has been moving along through the Gospel of Mark, moving his direction, intentional purpose toward Jerusalem, it's been kind of like a train, right? It's building momentum. I don't think there was any click clacks in that, but there was a whole lot of noise in different ways and times. Lives were changed, transformed. People's visions and dreams were changed, corrected, or irritated either way. Jesus has brought them along. And here they are on this track, on this direction. And he's going to go to the temple and proclaim that he is the Messiah. He's going to climb up into the temple at the point of announcement, the pinnacle of the temple, and say, and they're going to blow the ram's horns, and they're going to say, he's here, it is, celebrate. They do all that, and they're crying, Hosanna. And the ticker tape, the palm branches. Are fly. And Jesus says, let's go on. And they go to the temple courts. And the disciples are saying, yeah, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. Climbs up the steps to the temple courts. He walks into there. And as Gospel of Mark says, what's he do? He goes in there. He looks around and what was going on, and then he turns around and says to the disciples, says, it's been a good day. It's late. Let's go home. Now, how did that feel? See, the train been running, right? All that momentum, everything, everybody who had been collected and brought along in this parade is there for this moment. And Jesus says simply, no, it's not what you think. There's more to this than what you think. How many times do we say to God, God, I have a good idea of where this is going and what we're going to do and how it should be. Let me guide you. Let me tell you what it should be. Every time I've done that, I just just knocked over a bunch of stuff. People in my Bible study don't sit close to me. They say, that's the danger zone right there. But as they're moving into it, Jesus says, it's not what you think, it's more. Unfortunately, what happens is We set our sights too low. We set our eyes upon the vision of what we think God should do, and it's always less than what God desires or wants, not only for us, but for others around us and the world around us. Perspective. We don't do a good job with it, do we? At least I don't. He led them to the place they expected. The prophets had said, this is how it's going to be. Or at least how they interpreted it was going to be. Or the people that followed the prophets interpreted how it was going to be. He said, no, not not now. And everybody kind of like, it was, it was like a, 
a birthday balloon the next day. Y'all know what a birthday balloon looks like the next day? Either it has lost the helium or it is in pieces on the floor, okay? Either way, it kind of deflated. And Jesus takes his disciples and says, we're going over there. Come on. We're in this season of Holy Week this week. And Jesus is leading us through what we think he should do to where he really is and where he needs us to be. Here's the cool thing about it. You would expect that after all this buildup, that when Jesus turns around and walks away from the temple, that everybody would just throw up their hands and say, not we're done. It wasn't what we thought, so we're done. Truth is, those disciples continued following. They may have been bewildered. They may have been scratching their head. They may have been wondering, well, what's happening now? But they had seen enough in Jesus to know of what he had done and can do. And they followed. They kept going. They kept going. For we walk by faith, what? Not by sight. Because our sight, our eyes, sometimes confuse us, sometimes are tricked, sometimes can't see all the things that are there. Both the glorious things as well as the pitfalls, the things that trip us up and seek to destroy us. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And he gathers them around him and he goes. And where does he go? The other gospel writers say that he went to a garden called what? Gethsemane. The Mount of Olives. Here's the cool thing about the Mount of Olives. It's taller than the Temple Mount. Did you know that? About close to 300 feet. And in that place, you have a perspective that is different than where the Temple is. And it was there Jesus went to pray. See, the journey's not over. When the disciples arrived with Jesus at the temple, in the temple, and they're walking around looking, they're asking the question of Jesus, are we there yet? And they're saying it with finality. And you know what Jesus said? He said, no, not yet. Not yet. How do we receive our Lord and our Redeemer when he says, no, not yet? And can we walk and follow him in faith to a cross? Let's pray together. Lord, you know our needs. You know the way in which you may turn us around. And that you might be the power and the strength of our souls 
of our lives and pull us to where we need to be. Lead us, Lord Jesus, because we're not there yet. And we need you more than ever. Amen. As always, the invitation is this. If you're struggling in your faith, you're not in bad company. <laughs> if you need a pastor to pray with you, I'll be glad to, and we'll pray together. Wherever the need, the altar's available, or you can make that pew an altar to seek the direction and the guidance and the strength of our Lord, our strength, and our leader. As we stand to sing our closing hymn, 301. <laughs>
I share the benediction. Be aware. There's a number of services that will take place this week. Look on the back of your bulletin. Times and places. Receive the benediction, go in the grace, the peace. Be careful to follow Jesus Christ. In everything you do, know that he is with you. He is faithful. If we are faithful to follow him and serve him, you're going to be okay. Live in that assurance until we meet again. May God bless him.